No Credits Roll. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 11 of No Credits Rolled. My name is Sam Whalen, your host. Uh, today, we're going to recap some of my personal highlights from Summer Games Fest and the other conferences. Of course, if you're, if you're in the gamer world, <laughs> as, as we like to call it, us gamers, uh, you probably have heard of some of the news from some of these conferences. Uh, we had some big announcements, some small announcements, uh, but this is my favorite time of year when it comes to gaming news. I love watching these conferences. I love seeing people react to them. I like the big, you know, the big announcements, but then also some surprise indie games. It's just, it's a great time of year. It's like Christmas, but, you know, for game announcements. Uh, but anyway, before we get started, I want to remind everyone to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Spotify, Apple, you know, anywhere you get your audio, we will be there for you. Uh, we're on TikTok and YouTube. We're doing video versions for the show now. Uh, so just search No Credits Rolled and you will find us there. Uh, check us out. You know, we, we've... Uh, I spend some time on the video version for the show, and you know I'm pretty proud of those when they do come out. It's nice to have a visual companion when I talk about a lot of these games. Uh, but yeah, all right, let's get into the show. Of course, the first thing I want to cover here is SGF Live, the big kickoff event for this uh, wonderful season, hosted by our Lord and Savior, Jeff Keighley. Uh, there were some fun reveals here. A lot of people were saying this was a disappointing conference, but I think the problem is when you go into SGF and you go into a Jeff Keighley-hosted event, you want the big reveals you want the crazy thing you didn't see coming and i think it's just it's just how things go where we get our hopes up and you know even jeff came out before the show and he was like he tried to he always tries to meet our expectations and you you know this time i think he said he was in a q a and he gave it the show an eight out of ten which you know he's not going to say anything lower than an eight because then people aren't going to watch i think an eight out of a ten is a good answer but for a viewer and someone who is a little more critical, that kind of translates to a 6 out of 10, in my opinion. So I have been pulling from different recap websites from different uh, sources. And for this one, for SGF Live, we're going to be pulling from Sam Loveridge and the team over at Games Radar. So the first big announcement, they kicked the show off with it, was a LEGO Horizon Adventure, which is a LEGO version of the Horizon games on PlayStation, uh, puts Aloy in a wonderful co-op world later this year across PC, PS5, and Nintendo Switch, and that last part we're going to come back to, but having that announced to Switch is kind of crazy. Uh, I have here, I, I'm actually very interested in this game. It looks pretty cool. I like the Horizon games, you know, very passively. I've never completed one. They're they're very, they're high quality games, of course. They're, they're great. The team at Gorilla knows what they're doing, and they've really figured it out, especially with the second game. I've praised in the second game, uh, Forbidden West, the facial animations. I think they're the best I've ever seen. And, you know, I, I've enjoyed my time with those games, but they've never really hooked me in the way that I really wanted them to. I don't know if it's the combat or the the mechanics of the world or the characters I'm not very interested in. I don't know. It's just never been one of my favorite franchises, even though on paper it should be, right? Giant robot dinosaurs, check. Who doesn't love those? Open world exploration, always a fan of that. You know, uh, really cool traversal mechanics, which they amped up in the second game. I don't know. Part of it is I don't, I'm not a big fan of the weapons. I don't like using the bow and arrow in most games. I find it to be really boring. Um, I, Joe's, my friend Joe's listening. He's a big bow and arrow guy. You know, to each their own, but, you know, I prefer a gun. <laughs> and there are other weapons in Horizon. You know, you've got the explosion slingshot and the, the tripwire. And the idea is you've got all these tools in your arsenal because you're, like, kind of a hunter. And you've got – you're supposed to use all these tools to your disposal to, you know, take down these behemoths. But it's never really clicked for me in the way that I wanted. Now, this Lego game, the trailer was really great. First off, it looks stunning. They're sort of, it looks like they're kind of taking from the Lego movies that kind of Lego animation. And I think that's a great call. I think that allows people to sort of have an entryway into this game. Because if you've, you know, they've seen those movies, they know what Lego's talking and running around and doing actions are going to look like. It looks a little bit different than those classic Lego games we're all familiar with. Now, the biggest thing for me with this game is it looks like they're really doing that Lego humor, but in the Horizon world, and they kept Ashley Birch as Aloy, but it looks like they're letting her have more fun and sort of taking the, um, you know, sort of not limiting her performance, because that's a big problem a lot of people have with Horizon is the character of Aloy and how... Um, I don't want to, not muted, but sort of just held back she is. She's, she doesn't really, um, I don't know. I've, she's not, I'm not a big fan of the character. She's not that interesting to me. Um, I know people have different opinions on it, but that's one of the things that never really grabbed me about those games was, was that character. 
And it looks like if they're going to take it in a more Lego humor kind of route, then I really think her performance is going to shine. And I think her comedic timing is always great. So I'm really curious to see what they do with that here. Uh, and they showed a... What are, the, what are the big dinosaur? The T-Rexes, I think, are Thunder Jaws, maybe? They showed one of those. And, you know, that looked pretty cool. They showed the boss fight with that. And the fact that it's co-op, always a plus. I don't know if it'll be online co-op, because LEGO games are real weird about that. Some games have it, some games don't. I hope it's online, because I would like to not... You know, I'm a big proponent of couch co-op, but I think you should have both if you can, if you can have online co-op and couch co-op. You know, when the LEGO Star Wars Remastered games came out, or what was it, the Skywalker Collection, something, whatever they called it. I, my, Joe and I were super excited for that. And we did play that couch co-op when it initially came out. Um, but I still have yet to finish that game. And I think if there was an online option, I would be more incentivized to do it because you can always play with someone that's not necessarily right next to you, but, you know, wherever they may be. Uh, what else do I have for this game? Oh, yeah, the last thing here, you know. Uh, it's on Switch. It's coming to Switch. So we've got a PlayStation game coming to a Nintendo console, or a PlayStation Studio game coming to a Nintendo console, which is pretty crazy. Uh, is that going to open the door for more things coming to Switch in the future? Possibly. Uh, I'd like to see this this crossover. You know, console exclusives are... I think they're becoming a thing of the past to a certain extent. Uh, we'll get to the Xbox conference later, and that kind of disproves what I just said, but... Uh, it's nice to see more people being able to play more games. I think that's a positive across the board. Oh, I also want to preface, I should have said this in the top of the show, uh, for all these conferences I'm going to be covering, I'm only talking about the stuff that I care about. Uh, you know, kind of selfish of me, but hey, you know, I'm not going to talk about something I know nothing about or have no interest in. So, you you know, always go check out these conferences yourself if you're interested in the full shows. Uh, but for me, this show is going to be sort of a best of highlight reel. So, speaking of that... The next game we have up is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Rita's Rewind. Uh, this came out of nowhere, and the second they started playing that cool rock version of the Power Rangers theme song, which is by a band that I like. I'm going to look it up. Hang on. Okay, so they're called the Punk Rock Factory. They have various albums that are covers of all kinds of things. I mean, they have they got really popular when they did covers of Disney songs like Let It Go and stuff. But they did an album on old 80s shows. They did uh, some games, uh, Disney stuff. They're great. I'm a particular fan of their Power Rangers song, which was used in this trailer. It goes very hard. And I'm glad that they used it for this trailer because it was it was perfect. And this, this game was one of my biggest hype reveals. And like I said, it came out of nowhere. Uh, so it's coming from Digital Eclipse, who did a lot of these retro remakes. They did the TMNT Cowabunga Collection, a bunch of other stuff. And it looks like Hasbro is getting in on the video game universe with this sort of Hasbro Rewind branding. Uh, it also includes a G.I. Joe game that's coming out that was shown at a different conference, but looks very similar to this Power Rangers game. They're both sort of going for that um, side-scrolling beat-em-up, which I played the TMNT Shredder's Revenge game, and I love that game. And it looks like they're going for that again with a Power Rangers game. Perfect. It's a perfect idea, in my opinion, I love, like I said, love that Team NT game. Give me more of that. And in a Power Rangers setting, yes, please. Not to mention, it looks like they've added other stuff in the trailer. Like there's there's the Mechazord fights where it's it almost looked first person, I think. There's a motorcycle chase part that looks like an old arcade game. It looks like they've added a lot of stuff more than just being a beat-em-up. So I'm super excited for this to come out. And, you know, the Power Rangers are cool. I was a big Power Rangers SPD fan when I was a kid. Um, so, you know, for what that's worth, maybe I can include the hashtag Power Rangers in this episode now. I think this is going to be the original crew, though, which everybody loves. So I'm really excited for this one, and I hope it's coming uh, to console. I neglected to check if it was, but fingers crossed. I'm sure it will. And then, yeah, that G.I. Joe game also looks great. Uh, sort of the same thing, but with G.I. Joe. And G.I. Joe is also cool, all right? I'll admit it. Might as well do a Transformers game at this point, right? I mean, it's Hasbro. They own this stuff. Give me a, what else do they, like, Clue? Do they own Clue? They own a lot of board games. Uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Rita's Rewind. That's tough to say. Uh, it will be coming out soon. Super stoked for that one. All right, this, this, so this was my third and final hype reveal for this show. So it's four years after releasing on PC. Valorant is coming to PS5 and Xbox Series X. Uh, and there's a beta coming probably right around the time this episode's going to drop. 
Uh, so you can sign up for that and try to get codes. But yeah, I've been wanting Valorant on PC for a very long time. This is a game that I desperately want to get into, but I also refuse to play on PC. I have it installed on my gaming computer, but I very rarely play it just because something about the the setup of playing on a laptop or a PC, I just I really don't like it. I like the convenience of having a console that I can turn on on my big, nice TV and play it there. So I'm super excited that Valorant is now coming to console. I'm really curious how it's going to play. Uh, my friends and I have been playing a ton of Siege lately, Rainbow Six Siege, and I hope that has prepped us for Valorant. Um, I know it's a little, it's a different kind of game, but I'm I'm really looking forward to trying this one. And I hope I'm able to get in on the beta. It is a closed beta, so you do need to get codes. But I believe if you are qualified, you get five extra codes to give to your friends. So I'm going to you know be hitting up everyone I can to try to get codes for that. I do have a note here. Um, I complain about this probably every episode. Uh, but will we get dominated by PC players if there's crossplay, which there definitely will be? Uh, yeah, probably. But hey, you know, maybe they'll give us some bots. I don't know if Valorant has bots. But, you know, let me have a little bit of fun before the, the sweaters come in, you know. Uh, again, this is my complaint every episode about stuff, but uh, these people have also had a four-year head start on us for how to play this game, so I would like a little bit of time to get acclimated before I'm thrown into the, the deep end. Uh, but yeah, very much looking forward to this. I hope it runs well. I hope they can do a nice full release. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to what, what they got on console. So that's Valorant coming to console uh, very soon, at least a beta. All right, so that wraps up SGF Live. Uh, like I said, you know, I, I think we get our expectations a little bit too high for those shows. And, you know, like I got something out of it. I think you can, you know, if you watch it, you'll get at least one or two cool announcements out of it. Uh, but moving on to the next conference, this was the one that really surprised everyone, including myself, considering how much smack I talk on Xbox, but it's the Xbox conference. So all this coverage in this portion of the show comes from Nicole Carpenter and others at Polygon. Uh, Xbox crushed this conference. I mean, that's pretty much the general consensus. People are saying it's their best conference ever. I don't know about that. I'm not familiar with enough of their conferences to say that. I definitely think it's what Xbox needed right now, given their sort of uh, state lately. I think this was a great little, almost like a, a new setup of dominoes for the things to fall in 2025. So they kicked off the show with Black Ops 6, which we kind of all knew was coming. Uh, they also ended the show with a little Black Ops 6 direct, like 20 minute segment. So I'm just going to talk about both those things now just because it works easier for the flow of things. Uh, but Black Ops 6 looks pretty great, guys. I don't know. I'm very skeptical still because it's, you know, I've, I've been burned by Call of Duty so many times, but it's coming to Games Pass, so I'm definitely going to be playing it. And, you know, there's the new Omni movement, um, which looks interesting. It kind of looks like um, like Max Payne almost, but in Call of Duty. I'm really curious how that's going to feel on console. Obviously, PC players are going to absolutely activate with that, being able to turn in any direction. Uh, classic prestige systems are back for multiplayer. I did not know that at first, but I'm really glad to see that. Uh, that actually makes me get interested in multiplayer because I really, when I was younger, I would do prestiges and, and all those old Call of Duties. And it was kind of a bummer when they did away with that and you just had like an infinite level cap. I like the idea of resetting, getting that new level, getting rewards for hitting that max level and then starting from scratch. I like being incentivized to hit that level cap and then restart and not just get stuck on using the best gun in the game for every match just to get the most kills. I find it to be very boring. And that's kind of where the multiplayer will lose me. But I like the cycle of, you know, starting from scratch again and leveling everything up. I think I talked about this last week, but I hope this makes a big splash. And I hope this Call of Duty game really hits for people and gets me personally back into the COD campaigns and multiplayer. Because I, I really have fallen off since that original Modern Warfare, well, the second technically Modern Warfare remake uh, in 2019. Nothing's really hit like that for me since then. And, you know, I'm thinking about going back to uh, Cold War because I really don't remember much of that game, but I know it was pretty well praised. Uh, I, I might go back to that and play the campaign in that just to kind of get a refresher because a lot of those characters are returning, it seems. At least um, the guy that looks like Robert Redford, I think his name's Adler. He was in the trailer, so it looks like it's the same continuity. Um, so I might go back and check that out and kind of just get a refresher for the gameplay feel and, and for the story there. But yeah, Call of Duty Black Ops 6, you know, I really think they crushed this presentation with that aspect of it. People knew this was coming for this presentation, and I really think they met those expectations and showed it off really well. 
So with this Xbox conference, it's kind of like hype announcement after hype announcement. Next up, we have uh, Doom the Dark Ages. Oh, man, this leaked beforehand, so it was kind of spoiled. But like, it's one thing to read it in a leak, but it's, one th- it's another thing to see it, right? This was another hype reveal. Uh, first off, if you put Doom music behind anything, it's going to be hype. I love the soundtracks in Doom. They're absolutely iconic. Uh, it's also called the Dark Ages, which is sick. Love that title. So Doom Slayer has a shield now and a cape because it's like medieval kind of or whatever. I don't even know where in like time it's set, but I know it's during when the, the Doom Slayer was a, a knight or something. I don't know. It looks great. I like that they're innovating on the gameplay. They did it with the second game, adding more platforming stuff, and it looks like they're going to keep innovating with this third game. Uh, there were mechs, like big, like, I already mentioned Mechazord, but let's say that cool word again on the show. Doom guy has, like, a mech suit that's, like, a giant robot. I have no idea how that's going to work. Uh, there's a dragon that he rides in the trailer. Like, it just looks exciting and thrilling, and I really, that's why I like the Doom games. They're just so much fun to play, and the the loop of those games of, you know, just mindless, not mindless killing, because there is, you know, you have to ration ammo and stuff and switch weapons, but it just never gets old. It really doesn't. And the more of these games they make, the better. Uh, I already mentioned the music, but give me more of that music, too. I just, <laughs> there's so much to love about these games. If you like FPSs, go play the first two. They're great. Um, I actually picked up the expansions for the second game recently, and I was working my way through them. And, you know, like, you know, you just never get tired of that gameplay. It's just they really nailed it in the first game, and they just continue to innovate on it and make it even better. So super excited for the Dark Ages. Next up, we got uh, State of Decay 3. Uh, I'm dying for this game to come out. They teased it last year, I think, and it was just a cinematic. But now we got more cinematic and what looked like gameplay. It looks very graphically impressive, and, and there's a real atmosphere to it that I'm excited for. I think people sleep on the State of Decay series, but I've l- always really loved those games, especially 2. They really stepped it up, in my opinion, with 2. It's a great sort of zombie simulator, and the way they do Survivor... There's like a roguelite element to it, almost, with how you can roll new Survivors and the different backgrounds and perks they have. I think it's a ton of fun. It's like my perfect zombie game, in my opinion. I think it's the closest to, like what a Walking Dead game should be, um, but with, you know, not the Walking Dead characters that we know. So to get a third one and to have it look this good, I'm super, uh, I keep saying I'm super excited, but, you know, it's exciting. It's an exciting time, folks. It's an exciting time. I don't know. I don't think we got a release date for this, but a lot of these things in this conference are 2025, so hopefully it's, you know, they don't get pushed back. But I, I'm looking forward to seeing more of this game and I hope when it comes out, it can somehow come to PlayStation so I can play it with my friends because I think we'd have a lot of fun. It's one of those games that I think really shines if you can play it with other people, much like Sea of Thieves, which eventually got ported over and we're playing that now on PlayStation. I would love to see State of Decay end up on PlayStation somehow, but we'll see what happens. So now we have Dragon Age The Veil Guard. Uh, I don't have a whole lot for this, but uh, I really liked Dragon Age Inquisition. I never played any other Dragon Age game except for that one. And this trailer they showed at the conference looks like you're kind of putting a team together. That's always fun. Uh, we did see gameplay now that people, I guess the embargo is probably lifted, so people are posting their gameplay. And it looks like they're going for more of a action game, less of the uh, tactical RPG stuff we had in Inquisition. That was sort of a blend of the, the tactical RPG and the action RPG. Looks like they're kind of taking it back to just straight action in this, sort of more like a Mass Effect uh, the one thing I did see is that you can't control your, you can't like uh, inhabit your squad mates anymore. You just uh, command them, which is a little bit of a bummer. I liked being able to jump around and be different classes depending on which teammates I had with me. But it looks like it's going to work more like Mass Effect, where you're just giving them orders and they're firing off um, their different abilities. You know, I think it'll still be fun. It just means that I have to, you know, work a little bit harder to like the class that I picked because that was always the thing in Inquisition where. You know, you roll your guy and you're like, oh, this is kind of boring. I want to use magic for a little bit. So you jump over to your wizard character or I want to be, you know, an archer. And you jump over to the archer character. Um, it, you know, it'll it'll suck not having that, but I think it'll still work. And again, the gameplay looks super fun. I like that it's more action-y. Um, I think it's going to work a lot better in the world because honestly, one of my few complaints with Inquisition was that combat could get a little busy with all the different things going on and having to manage your different party members. I think just having to focus on yourself for the most part will make things a little bit easier and a little bit more streamlined. Uh, So we'll have to see whenever that comes out. And of course, you know, this is a big thing for Bioware. 
Bioware really has to nail this game, I think. Um, and we talked about Starfield before and, and setting our expectations too high for Bethesda. And it's kind of a similar situation here with Bioware where it looks like they're returning to what they're good at. And, you know, if we get those great stories with our companions that we like in Bioware games, we get that great RPG mechanics and, and you know, a great world. I think there's a lot of potential here for Bioware to kind of make a return with uh, Dragon Age the Veil Guard. So we'll have to see. Uh, but my hopes are high for this. You know, I, I, I'm i hoping it does well, and I, I hope that it lives up to the hype that it does have. All right, so next we got some Starfield stuff. Uh, I'm still playing Starfield, believe it or not. I, I cannot believe I am still playing it, uh, but I am. This was mostly an update with a tease for the DLC, which is called Shattered Space. Uh, it mostly just felt like a reminder for people that Starfield does, in fact, exist. Uh, it didn't really blow my mind too much, but, you know, I, I'm curious what the expansion will have. It looks like they're doing sort of a Eldridge Horror Cthulhu kind of thing. What that will actually look like, I'm not sure. Uh, they added uh, the mod integration, like the Bethesda Workshop stuff on console, which is cool. I'm sure there's plenty of fixes for things that Bethesda didn't fix. I haven't really explored the mods too much because it turns off your achievements, and I want to finish the or try to finish the game and still get some achievements for that. So I haven't really looked into the mods, but um, you know, hey, Starfield's not that bad. You should go check it out. Especially if you're really eager for like a new Skyrim game or something, it definitely can scratch a little bit of that itch. Next up, we have a game called South of Midnight. Uh, the reveal trailer for this was last year, I believe, but we got a little bit more gameplay this time around, and this game looks super unique. Uh, I don't have the studio here, uh, but it reminds me of Cana Bridge of Spirits if you ever played that game. Very visually impressive, very cool environments, very cool character designs. And uh, I want to know more about the gameplay because they they show you climbing a tower and ringing a bell, but then that that's that was kind of it. And with how unique the world looks, I'm curious if it's going to be sort of an action adventure game or what we're dealing with here. Uh, but I like the setting of like the I don't know if it's Louisiana, but it looks like Louisiana, like the sort of swamp bayou areas. There's a big fish that's like your friend. That's cool. You have like a like a Fortnite parachute to fly around. I don't know. The animation on the character looked interesting too. It looked like it's sort of that Spider-Verse thing where the characters are rendered a little bit lower frame rate compared to the rest of the world. Uh, So we'll have to see what that ends up looking like. You know, it's cool. It's also good to see new games, new ideas when everything, you know, seems like it's a sequel or a remake of stuff. It's nice to get something fresh and something new. So, you know, I'm looking forward to this one too. And that's why I included it on the list. Speaking of remakes... Next, we have Perfect Dark, which is a full-on new game. Is it a remake if it's, like, not even close to the original? I don't know. Perfect Dark, those games already existed for, like, a long time ago. And now they're making a new one. And it looks like... I never played any of those original games, but it looks like Cyberpunk and Spy Stuff, which I love. Always give me more of that. And uh, no release date for this either. This That's actually a common theme for a lot of these games, no release date. Xbox is kind of just really banking on 2025 to pop off. Um, but yeah, Perfect Dark, if... I, I'm I'm speculative about Perfect Dark, because if you watch the trailer, there are, it shows what looks like gameplay, but like I don't buy that that's how the game is actually going to play. Um, there's like little like takedowns and stuff that... I think her name's Joanna Dark, which that's a cool name, that she does, that I'm like, there's no way this is going to work like this in gameplay. I don't know, we'll see. It looks like it might be a little. It looks like it might be a little indulged for this trailer. I'm curious what the actual game will feel like because you know we don't want to get into the Cyberpunk uh, 2077. Is that the name of the game? Hang on. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't want to repeat a Cyberpunk 2077 where we're our hopes are to the moon and then we get the game and it's like oh it's a it's an RPG okay like I I want to keep my expectations metered but. I love the spy stuff. I love the cyberpunk stuff. So I want to see more of this game, especially I want to see more gameplay. But it also looks like it's it's not really close to being released yet. So we'll have to see what happens with that. Then we had more Indiana Jones. This was basically just a super long cutscene, uh, mostly all cinematic. We had a little bit more gameplay, but I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. I'm still going to play this when it comes out. You know, I'm a big Indiana Jones fan. I just hope the game isn't terrible. Right? I hope it's good. I did find that the the sort of tone and the humor in the cutscene and the cinematic was a little weird. I don't know if it necessarily landed. Um, but yeah, 
I really want to know what this gameplay is going to feel like as well. Especially the Melee stuff. I talked about that when it was initially shown off at an Xbox... What was it? Developer Direct? It might have been the first episode I ever did of this show. But I want to know more of what that game's going to feel like to play. Because, you know, the Wolfenstein games are great. The folks over at Machine Games know what they're doing. And I just want to know how that's going to feel once the controller's in my hands. And I would also like to see a full gameplay demo, too. They're really relying a lot on these cinematics and stuff. And I, I... I hope they show more of it uh, before it releases, but, you know, it's Indiana Jones, it's Troy Baker doing the voice, which, there's always, like, one line in these in the first trailer they did, and in this trailer, where he says something, I'm like, that sounds super weird, uh, but, like, 90% of the time, it sounds great, so, Troy Baker's super talented, he's doing his best Harrison Ford, we'll have to see what it's like in the full game. So this was the big, one more thing reveal, Gears of War E-Day, which, man, that's a cool title. It's a prequel. Your Marcus is back. Dom is back. All your favorite Gears of War characters. And they're not old or dead. They're all young and fit and they're back. So this takes place before Gears 1. Um, I don't know why. And this might have leaked. I have no idea. I was not expecting a prequel game. I mean, they've they've committed so hard to these new games, 4 and 5, of like the new timeline. and Not the new timeline, but the new characters and like the new canon. I was not expecting a prequel, but I think it's a great idea. Nothing, I don't have anything against 4 and 5. I like those games. But there's just something about those original characters that people really like. And now you can cash in on the nostalgia because it's been so long. So you can bring back those characters that that people love. I mean, like Marcus is still in those new games, but not a whole lot of other people are, I don't think. It's been a while since I played them. But like, Dom's definitely dead. His, spoilers. His death is like one of the most iconic moments in the franchise. So to get all them back, you know, and I'm sure we'll get Cole and all them, hopefully. It'll be a lot of fun to see. Uh, There was, I saw an article saying they're going to bring back more of the horror elements. Really wondering what that's going to look like. I remember in the first game there was the section, I don't remember what they were called, but it's like when you can't go into the shadows, you have to stay in the light or else this this like big swarm of like bat things eats you. And that was pretty spooky. Uh, And the trailer shows a little bit of that. Like it, it just shows you, it's a cinematic, but it shows you the size of the locust and it's a like, knock down drag out fight with Marcus. So I wonder if they'll kind of go into that more of like the how scary the locust can really be instead of it just being like a Michael Bay like balls to the wall, every gun in the world is firing at once kind of thing. Uh but very excited for this one. Very excited to play more gears. I love Gears of War. I really got in since uh I dropped in with two. Three was like a I loved that game. Then I played the remaster of 1, and then I've been into 4 and 5. 5 was really good. Um, But I just, I don't think the Gears games have managed to capture the general public, especially in terms of being an Xbox pillar, and Xbox brand. I don't think they've managed to capture that interest since that original Gears trilogy. Oh, also, um, what was the other one called? Gears Judgment? The one where you play as Damon Baird? That was a great game, too. I just think they might have flown a little under the radar, even though they're like quadruple a games and you know i think this is the way to do it to get a lot of people back in is to bring back your og characters and maybe halo should take a note you know just saying just saying so the other presentation was the ubisoft presentation their their presentation was kind of lame i'll be honest uh there were two things i want to hit on for this and it was pretty much the only two things that were Super relevant in the whole presentation. Uh, very quickly off the top, there was Prince of Persia Lost Crown news, which I didn't include it in the notes but because I, I forgot about it. But they announced uh, some DLC for that, some challenge maps for that. You know, I love that game. I'm probably not going to go back to it, but super happy for the people that love, love that game that they're going to get more content for it. They teased the Sands of Time remake, uh, remake in 2026, which is super far away. But it looks like they're going with a different art style for that. All they showed was like a candle, but... People that want that game are really looking into that candle to try to extract meaning from it. And there was another game called Prince of Persia Rogue or something like that made by a different team. And I had never heard of that game, but that looks pretty cool. And it looks like a different version of something like a Lost Crown, so I might have to check that out as well. Uh, But anyway, the two big things from the Ubisoft presentation, the first one was Star Wars Outlaws. Uh, This was crazy, right? This just, I, my expectations are very low for this game. Um, and they still kind of are, but they're definitely a little bit higher after seeing this trailer. This trailer really sold me on this game. You know, I think if this trailer is accurate and is to be believed, which you always have to take these things with a grain of salt because they are 
deliberately cinematic, even if it is gameplay. They do have things canned in a certain way to make it look as good as possible. But if this leaves up lives up to the hype, you know, I really think this could be my kind of game. It is a Ubisoft game, very clearly. It is open world, it is exploration, and I think that's a great way to take a Star Wars game. You know, we had the Jedi Survivor and Fallen Order games, and Jedi Survivor in particular really tried to get more into that open world thing. They had, like, different planets, with, which were their own open worlds, and I think they did a really good job there. But I think the, specifically the Ubisoft brand of open world would really work for Star Wars. I mean, they showed off ship uh, combat, ship flying, and you can land on the planet, which seemed like a, a middle finger to Starfield. Um, but I think the way they showed it here is a really good fit. And you're like a, you're not a Jedi, you're like a smuggler. So I think it's a great way to utilize those mechanics as well. Uh, great Star Wars language in this trailer. I mean... Look, Star Wars is a lot of things to a lot of people, but there are a lot of things that translate well no matter what. Like the sound effects, there are a lot of great sound effects in this, and this is this is deep in the weeds here. But like the they they showed the lock picking mechanic, and it's 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 like the locks from the movie, and everybody clapped. You know, it's it's great. I don't know, I like that part. Like I said, the ship combat looks good. The music kicks in, and and if especially if that music is good throughout the whole game. I think that could really be a standout because you just can't beat that sort of John Williams-esque music in a Star Wars world. Uh, I'm waiting for the full release here to see if there are some sort of performance issues or some other glaring problem that brings this game down. But this presentation was really well done. You know, and it, it really, it raised my hopes for this game that I was very low on prior to this because I just, I didn't expect much from Ubisoft with this, honestly. And they, they really sort of changed my mind here. So we're going to have to see what happens. Um, I also double dog dare them not to have any lightsabers in this game. I don't know if they'll be able to help themselves because it is Star Wars and Star Wars loves lightsabers. But hey, uh, I would also like Cad Bane. Give me Cad Bane in this game and it's instantly a 10 out of 10. Cad Bane is cool and he's the best. So put him in the game. And don't lock it behind a pre-order either. All right. And the other thing in the Ubisoft forward, I think it was called, the Ubisoft presentation, whatever it was called, uh, was Assassin's Creed Shadows. Um, this is another one that kind of set my expectations for the game. I wasn't really sure what to expect going into it. Uh, the trailer was very visually stunning. I think the setting helps a lot with that. And Assassin's Creed settings are always a highlight of these games, and it's one of the things people look forward to, including myself. And I think Japan will be a standout. I think they're really putting in the effort here. Uh, the ability to choose between protagonists for missions, which they showed off in that trailer, is very interesting. I wonder what the limits for that will be and how it will impact gameplay. Um, are you encouraged to replay missions maybe to see different paths you can do? Um, Ghost of Tsushima is it's hard to not bring up when you talk about this Assassin's Creed game. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima is one of my favorite games of all time. And I, it's for me personally, I'm not going to be able to help myself but compare the two. So I hope Assassin's Creed can sort of shine in its own way and maybe bring things to the table that Ghost didn't do or couldn't do because of what kind of game they were trying to make. And, you know, I'm looking forward to more of this as well. Uh, Curious what the game, I mean, all these games, right? Curious what they're going to feel like once they're actually in our hands. Uh, But we're going to have to wait and see. But this was definitely a good showing for both Assassin's Creed and Star Wars Outlaws from Ubisoft. And uh, we'll have to see uh, what else comes down the pipeline as we get closer to release for these games. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I've got a quick little review on Destiny 2, The Final Shape. You're listening to No Credits Rolled. All right, and we're back on No Credits Rolled. Just got done covering the latest conferences from over the weekend. Now we're going to talk about Destiny 2, The Final Shape. Uh, Now, full disclosure off the top of this review, I've only done a handful of the story missions So I, you know, I'm nowhere near an expert on this expansion. I just want to give my quick little thoughts uh, because, you know, this has been a good time and I I probably will come back to it at some point on this show once I do finish it to give a little bit more in-depth thoughts. But this is just a quick little thing off the top here. Um, The big word that comes to mind playing this campaign, or I guess you can call it a campaign, playing these story missions so far, uh, the word that comes to mind is emotional. Uh, There really is a weight and a finality to to everything you do in this. And I think they're doing a good job of making this the final big thing for Destiny 2. And, you know, it's it's in every mission, whether that be Cade coming back, whether it be how you find Zavala and Ikora 
and all your all your pals, your your band of misfits as you pick them up one by one in this campaign. It's very emotional. I don't know how else to describe it. Now they do they do tug on your heartstrings a little bit too much. Um, I think they they know what they have, right? This game's been out for like ten years. <laughs> And for people like myself that have been there since day one, it's very easy to elicit emotion um, just because of the time that you spend in this. So, you know, having that initial cutscene where it's very similar to the beginning of the game where your ghost finds you and brings you back to life. And, you know, those things still hit. And it's it's very emotional. I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, I do want to touch on Lance Reddick here. Unfortunately, he passed away. It's very, very sad, very tragic. Uh, and, you know, may he rest in peace. But he is now, Zavala is now being voiced by Keith David. And I do want to talk about Keith David's performance. I love Keith David. I am a big fan of his in pretty much every role he's had uh, that I've uh, heard him or seen him in. Uh, He's, of course, for me, he'll always be the Arbiter from Halo. So hearing him now in a new Bungie game, a new Bungie shooter, having Keith David yell at me, uh, it's very nostalgic. And honestly, I think he does a great job. He's different from Lance Reddick. But I think he excels in his own way. It also helps that we go back to that word emotional, right? And and Zavala's mission that I just completed the other day at the time of recording, Zavala's mission is very emotional uh, to the point of almost being like saccharine. (laughs) Um, But it's Keith David does a great job. He's a obviously he's a pro. He's one of the best, and he really brings something different from Lance Reddick to this role. Uh, And of course, obviously Lance Reddick. Very tragic that he passed away, but I'm glad that we're continuing this Zavala character with a different voice. I'm glad they didn't just get rid of the character. Um, I'm glad that you know we're able to continue the character's story. I think the storytelling so far has been very well done. We're getting more of what the witness actually is and what they want and what they're doing. You know, Destiny's a tricky beast. You know, I've been there since day one, but I would still say I'm a pretty casual fan of these games. I've never done any raids. I mostly do the PvP and the strikes or any new story content that comes out. In terms of the lore, I could maybe give you like a two-paragraph description of the story. Um, Shout out to the YouTube channel. My name is Bif. He's a fantastic lore guy when it comes to all this stuff. Highly recommend you go check out his work. My name is Bif is great. If you want the lore, he's your best bet because Destiny can be really obtuse when it comes to that stuff. Thank God we don't have Grimoire cards anymore. Those were always fun to read um, if you went to the website, but... Uh, yeah, so in terms of the story and the and the payoff for this 10-year odyssey, um, I'm sure there's a ton of stuff I'm missing. But despite that, and despite my, um, my lack of knowledge, this is still hitting for me, right? And it really does feel like a finale for this game and for this story and for these characters. And I think, you know, I love interacting with the new ghosts. You know, we, we get to hear from Zavala's ghost and, and Cade's ghost. Um, I, I'm sure that's probably been done before. I know, I think Osiris's ghost was in at one point, but like having these different ghosts come into the story and sort of speak when their, uh, companions aren't there, I think it does a great job and it's a new perspective on the story. Uh, and again, in Zavala's mission, you get a great little moment with Zavala's ghost and him at the end of that mission that is like, wow, that's really super sad, but also very emotional. Uh, I like the new area. We're finally seeing inside the Traveler, and it's it's a very cool area. It's almost like fairy tale like in some ways, but also very abstract and and genuinely creepy and unnerving. At sometimes there's the sort of clash between what the witness and what the Traveler are doing, and it's sort of constantly reshaping itself, and new areas are um, be popping up or changing or warping. And it's not like the usual Destiny creepy horror stuff where it's like dark and there's like black goop everywhere with the hive. This is like a different kind of uh, uneasiness, I think. There's like weird faces and stuff that will come out of the walls. And like, I really think it's the imagery that's a lot different. And I think that is a a neat twist, especially when you're bringing in the witness who is this big villain. You want to kind of give them their own atmosphere. And I think that's exactly what they did here. Uh, So far, there have been more puzzles worked into the campaign gameplay. I'll be honest, not a big fan of these puzzles. Uh, they're annoying <laughs> uh, because if you mess them up, you have to fight another wave of enemies to then do the puzzle again. So if you're like me and you're an idiot and you mess it up, you just end up fighting these waves of enemies because you're not paying attention or can't figure out the puzzle. I could Google it, right? But I'm not going to do that because not yet. I haven't gotten to the point where I'm going to Google it. I might at some point, but I don't know. It's just um, 
The puzzles have really been bogging me down when I just want to get through this story and experience the story. Uh, but that's Destiny, right? They, there's puzzles in, I know there's puzzles in the raids and stuff, and that's just a mechanic that's in this game. So it's definitely, uh, you know, it's been there for a while. It's just, I think these particular puzzles, there's one in the beginning where you have to like rotate a dial. I swear I spent like 45 minutes trying to figure it out, and I it took forever. Um, it's, it's really that puzzle in particular that I'm calling out. But uh, the gameplay is still great. Obviously, the gunplay still feels fantastic. You've got the new abilities where you can mix and match all the different light abilities into one class. And I think that's super cool. Um, the way they're blending that together, I think, is is really neat. And to have it be the final thing you're getting in this game, I think it's a great idea. And I think it is a great way to show how far this game has come and how far we've come playing it. You know, now having a mastery over light and dark, I think thematically it works, and I think also in gameplay it works to just show that this is really, you know, the peak of of what you can do, both in the world and in gameplay. So, uh, yeah, that's Destiny 2, The Final Shape. Again, I'm very much looking forward to playing more of the story of it. I want to see where it goes. Um, I know the raid's been completed, so good for those people. Uh, I'm probably not going to play it, but I might look up a video on it. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing where this story goes and how it comes to an end. Um, and you know, I, I, I hope they keep Cade 6 around, but they're probably not going to do that. So I just preemptively rest in peace Cade 6 again. Uh, anyway, that's all my thoughts for now on Destiny 2 The Final Shape. And that is actually going to wrap it up for episode 11 of No Credits Rolled. Thank you so much for listening. Of course, you can always email questions and comments to nocreditsrolled at gmail.com. You can call and leave a voicemail at 856-209-0713. That's 856-209-0713. And we might just play it on the air. Make sure to subscribe to No Credits Rolled on Spotify and Apple, just like I said at the top of the show. Anywhere you get your podcast, we will be there for you. And of course, we also have a Patreon if you're feeling generous. But anyway, that's all I got. I'll see you next time on No Credits Rolled. 